The attitude of thanksgiving has been a proven weapon for believers since the days of creation. One of the early lessons my mother taught us while growing up as kids was the compulsory family morning devotions and night devotions. Every morning, my mother would go around each of our rooms singing hymns as she woke us up for morning devotions, and she would do the same at night when all her kids were back home. We never missed any devotions, regardless of what was happening in the house or who was there. I picked it up, and when I went to high school, my boarding house masters ensured we all woke up by 5 a.m., and we did personal devotions until 5.40 a.m. every day of the week, weekends included. There's something fresh about waking, and the first thing you do is talk to your father. There's a level where you can begin to enjoy God's presence so much that you can literally not wait to wake up and just say, Thank you, God. Many people go to bed at night with heavy hearts, carrying the burdens of the entire day with them. It becomes very easy to get discouraged from the attitude of waking up and thanking God because you are still feeling the pressures from the previous day. The challenges from the night didn't go away in your sleep after all. In such circumstances, it is difficult to muster enough motivation to even wake up and thank God. But listen to me, child of God, when all the chips are down, when there is no other hope, when life is too good to be true, when life is so difficult that it does not feel like reality, there is always a constancy in God, which is encapsulated in Psalms 30, 4. Sing to the Lord, ye saints of His. Give thanks for the memory of His holiness, for His wrath lasts only a moment. In His favor is life. Weeping may last all night, but joy comes in the morning. The night may have come with all the weight of responsibilities from the whole week, but joy comes in the morning. Whenever I wake and see the breaking of the day, I say, Thank you, Lord, says a song we learned in kids' church. Waking up and forgetting everything that has happened and is still happening and going to your father to say thank you, regardless of everything, is the application for your father to step into your case. Many people go on to lay their complaints before God every time. It is not wrong. He is your father and your complaints should go to him. But when you wake up in the morning, make it a point of remembering that you want to only thank him for being God. I am going to take you on a little journey to explain why you should thank God in the morning. And if you pay close attention to this trip, you will realize that your life is in good hands and very safe too. If you are ready for this journey, let's go. Why should you thank God in the morning? You guarantee your life's safety. The Bible says in Psalms 50, 23, Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I shew the salvation of God. Typical sacrifices in the Old Testament had to do with food items, animals, and other forms of sacrifice. But there came a time in the Old Testament when God began to long for more than the physical things the children of Israel were burning. This led to the scripture above. If you read a little further up in Psalms 50, you'll see where God told the children of Israel that he couldn't eat the meat or drink the wines they poured in his honor. So when you wake up in the morning and offer your praise and worship to God, you are glorifying him. Whenever you open your mouth to say, Father, thank you for your love, your protection, and your backing, you glorify him. Remember, this is a journey, so stay with me. So if you wake up in the morning and thank God, it is your chance to glorify him. And in the verse we just read, he says, He will show the salvation of God. Hear me, child of God. Your life becomes very safe in God's hands when you offer him sacrifices of praise that glorify him. The kingdom of God is run by covenants and principles. You can almost always derive a formula from the workings of these principles. For example, in this scenario, your praise and thanksgiving equal the glory of God. And the glory of God plus praise guarantees your life is in the hands of God. Thanking God guarantees victory. 
Thanking God in the morning guarantees that God starts your day's warfare with you. In the story of the Israelites, after God had sent them into slavery for years, He sent Moses to rescue them and bring them back to Him. The greatest single journey in history started, and the children of Israel faced obstacles and many tribulations on their journey to the Promised Land. One such obstacle was a city called Jericho, a walled fortress that they needed to pass through on their journey but couldn't access. But the Bible records in the book of Joshua that every day for seven days the children of Israel rose up early in the morning and marched around the city of Jericho. Early every morning they rose. There's something about rising early to engage in anything. In the same book of Joshua 6.15 it says, But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The rest of this story is history as we know it. The city fell because the people rose early to give thanks to God. The Bible says they only shouted and sang, which was enough for God to move into action. Hear me, child of God. You will not realize how much power God can bring around for your sake until you learn how to engage that power, how to trigger that power. Thanking God in the morning releases God's love, favor, and presence throughout your day. God, speaking in Proverbs 8, 17, and 18, says, I love them that love me, and those who seek me early shall find me. I have riches and honor with me, yes, lasting riches and righteousness. Those who seek God early are opportune recipients of His presence, which translates into so many things for whoever receives that presence. The entirety of God's existence is in His majesty and glory, which He bestows as His supernatural presence around those who love Him enough to seek Him early. I woke in the morning to say, Father, I am here to say, I love you, and I believe you have the best plans for me. I trust you completely, and I know everything that is happening is all from you. And I am here to return that thanksgiving to you, is the key to unlocking the presence of God for more wonders ahead. Believe me when I say that many times you will get answers quicker than prayers just by thanking God as if you've just received the manifestations of that request. So, child of God, you will win battles that you do not even know about just by engaging God in the mornings. From the days of creation, the only times God instructed people to perform anything were in the mornings or the cool of the evenings. When you wake up and remember everything that poses a challenge to you and went to bed on your mind, the devil might creep into your thoughts to make you begin to question if God really loves you. If He really loves you, why would you be going through so much right now? But listen to what the psalmist says in this scripture. Psalm 63.1 says, O oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water to see thy power and thy glory, as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. David, a man who understood the covenant of thanksgiving and rose up early, penned wonderful psalms to God, and it shows how much he was in tune with the principles of thanksgiving. Here's a song by the famous Nigerian pastor, Dr. Paul Enenchi, titled, In a Dry and Thirsty Land, that always blesses our hearts whenever it is played or sung in our gatherings. A song that depicts how God's power, glory, and greatness that we see in our churches become manifest inside of you as a result of the covenant of rising early to seek Him and thank Him. Just like the morning sun, the glory of God rises with us, and the very few people who know the secrets of effortless victories have made it a point of contact to meet with God every morning. Believe me when I tell you that any day I rush off into my day without proper engagement with God in the morning, my days usually do not go as well as they usually would. There are so many battles that your heart cannot even capture them. 
So many things control reality, and many times they are not even the causes we suspect. But rising up in the morning to give thanks to God guarantees that all those unseen battles are fought for you. That is the realm of effortless victories. The Bible and even God have warned us that there will be battles, and that these battles will not be carnal, and that physical weapons are useless against them. Thanksgiving is a show of humility, meekness, and surrender of the process, the outcome, and the glory to God. When you wake up and you thank God, you are telling Him that you are aware of your inabilities without Him. Then God, speaking in the book of 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Remember this, the glory of God is carried in His presence, and His presence dwells among the praise of your mouth and your heart. Every day is a divine gift from God to you. You may not know or understand this. You may not even feel like it. Yet, I want you to never forget this. Every day is God's gift to you. If people had the power to make payments for each day on earth, how long would you live? Only the rich and influential would be alive. Yet, when we all go to bed each night, we close our eyes in anticipation of the coming day. Almost every one of us forgets how special the blessing of opening your eyes again to life is. This is one of the most underrated blessings ever. Many of us would even wake up nagging, complaining, rather than praising. We would wake up thinking about what is before us than even what brought us here. My bills are yet to be paid. Oh, here we go. Another frustrating day to go to work. I am still in pains. My son is still lost. The mortgage is yet to be settled. I am tired of living. People design their day with all sorts of pain and anguish. The effect of this is that it creates a veil through which you see life and approach everything else. So much that, in the face of a reason to laugh, you will only see gloominess. In the face of any opportunity, you see a reason to have your hopes dashed, and so on. Dear friend, this is not living. Waking up each day should be one of the happiest things in your life. Opening your eyes to a brand new day should not serve as a reminder that your life hasn't changed for the better. Rather, it should serve as a reminder that God is not done with you yet, and there is hope for your future. So much in your life will change if you can wake up this way, seeing God's blessings from the start. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 21 through 23 says, Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His passions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Instead of waking to see that you still have no money in your account, wake up to see that you are alive and healthy. Instead of waking up to see that you are still sick, we wake up to see that God is your healer and can give you a testimony of healing today. I look at the huge number of people in the world today who are so angry, unhappy, weak, uninspired, and depressed, and it breaks my heart. Many of them are even believers. Once upon a time, you could walk up to a child of God anywhere and under any circumstance, and you'd find him or her exuding such unexplainable love joy and hope that you'd find it hard to believe they had any life's issues. However, today, when you walk around a mall and have the opportunity to find out the identity of some of the people coming and going, you'd be surprised to know there are spirit-filled children of God in the lot. Some of us may blame the government for making us sad, you may blame the economy, or someone else may blame the fact that people have become annoying, inhumane, that is insensitive and lacking in compassion for others, that everyone is easily triggered by one thing or another. Now, whether it is the decadence in the society, the corruption or incompetence of the government, insensitivity of other people, no one has the power to deny you of the blessings of each day more than you give them. 
I love how Habakkuk, the prophet of God, puts it in his book. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. What greater way to start and enjoy your day than this? You may be wondering, how do I enjoy my day when I have it all going bad for me? Dear friend, I can't say that I understand or even feel what you are going through. However, I'd like you to know that you also can enjoy life when you begin to pay attention to what's right than what's wrong in your life. For starters, you are a child of God and your heavenly Father loves you. God has proven this love for you through the sacrifice of His only Son and the gift of redemption that you have in Him. Not only so, just like we saw in Lamentations earlier, His love for you drives all of His actions towards you. He wants you to see beyond what the world has thrown or is throwing at you and to start seeing what He is doing and has already done for you. Something about the love of God that you need to know is that no matter what happens or is happening in your life right now, your hope in God is sure, and He will make things work out for you, both in this life and in eternity. Many of the people you envy in the world who seem to have everything going on for them outside of God do not have any hope outside of those things you see. Many of them try to console themselves through philanthropy, charities, and other acts of kindness to relieve themselves of some of this hopelessness. But like alcohol, after a while it wears off and they are back where they started, searching for something to fill the void and a sense of hopelessness inside of them that they feel of them regarding their future. You see, dear saint, the knowledge and acceptance of the love of God is therapeutic. It has the power to lighten your day, to put a spring in your steps and to make you glow. That's right. Do you understand the confidence a couple lives with when they know that each partner is madly in love with them and would do anything to make them satisfied? They aren't afraid or insecure whether their partner is there with them or not. No matter how hard their day may go, they find consolation in the fact that they are going home to be with one who understands, loves, supports, and accepts them. That knowledge alone gives them hope and that hope gives them strength to overcome whatever you may throw at them. Doesn't this agree with what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and verse 35, and Romans 8, verses 38 through 39? He wrote, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is how God wants you to think. This is how He wants you to face your day, knowing that He loves you, that you belong to Him, and He is responsible for you. This should make you get up each morning with gratitude like, wow, what a blessed day it is. God, I am thankful. I could never pay you enough for the gift of life you gave me today. It's another chance to experience you on earth. It is another opportunity to bless my world with the gifts you have planted in me. It is another time to try again when the devil wants me to quit. It is another opportunity to grow again, to meet new people, to share my faith, to learn something new. And more than anything else, to enjoy your love, Jesus. Now, this is how you go out winning. Do you see how this contradicts reminding yourself about your addictions, your pain, your setbacks from yesterday, your offenses from the office, your mounting bills before you? Now, don't get me wrong, that you wake up seeing God's blessings and choosing instead to enjoy the day does not automatically take all your problems away. It does not also mean that you embrace living in denial, oh no. The believers of old had this conviction in their heart so strong that even when they were dying, they still declared their hope in God's faithfulness for the glory of eternity in Jesus. In other words, we are not afraid to die. In fact, 
If our circumstances bring us to the point of death, we are willing to face it head on. Why? Because we are convinced that God loves us and what we have cannot be taken from us by something as small as death. We believe that what we have is beyond any comprehension of this life. We belong to a kingdom and a system that plays by a different set of rules. Our heritage is divine and our hope is unbreakable in the love of God that has been showered upon us. Whatever suffering I may face today does not define the love of God for me or His intentions in my life. No, God's love is greater than that. I won't define it by what I have in this world or not. Paul wrote something like this in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And so they could face martyrdom without flinching. They celebrated when they were arrested, sent out of their homes, robbed and beaten. They have each other's backs each time. Everyone admired them because they lived like they didn't have any problems or like all their problems had been solved, which is true because with Jesus, you have everything you need. Why? Because they knew their God. And the Bible says that those who know their God shall be strong and do great things. How will they do this in their own strength? No, but in the strength of the Lord. Their attitude has made it possible for them to live their lives daily casting all their worries, God, and choosing rather to give thanks and receive everything He has for them for that day. Dear believer, let God be God. Don't try to do His job. You do your part in love. Trust and honor Him. Let Him do His part to love, direct, and take care of you. Let God take the lead, and you will never get lost. Step out today with a different perspective. Enjoy the sunshine as you gratefully look upon it with the eyes God gave you. Enjoy the relaxed feeling as the fresh wind touches your skin. Enjoy each moment as you light up the world with your smile, bringing healing to everyone around you as you go. You will realize that you become more productive when you live like this, not carefree or depressed, but gratefully appreciating all that God is working in and through you. Wake up today and start living. There is more to your destiny than what you are going through today. Don't draw the curtain yet. Wake up. Start seeing the blessings that God has planted in and around your life. Decide to enjoy them today and watch as everything else begins to fall into place for you. Is it possible to talk about salvation without transformation? I don't think so. Transformation is the very essence and definition of salvation. How else do you prove your experience or encounter with Jesus if there's no evidence in your life? Indeed, true Christianity is proven through the accompanying fruits. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.20-24, That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. True Christianity and the acceptance of the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ sounds like a putting off of the old and a putting on of the new. That is the replacement of one thing with another. Let me lay a foundation here. The purpose of this message is to take you by the hand and lead you from where you are to a much more intentional Christian life, one in which you live as a true ambassador of God's kingdom and a worthy vessel he can use in a world covered by deceit and darkness. We trust God to use this message to correct your heart, rebuild and revive your confidence, and strengthen your faith in the righteousness and true holiness of Jesus. The call to salvation is a general call. That is, God beckons on all people, regardless of background, color, race, history, status, and so on, to come to Him and put their faith on His Son, Jesus Christ. In Titus 2.11, the Bible says, For the grace of God has appeared, 
that offers salvation to all people. God has set aside one day when he'll judge the whole world and destroy it because of the sin and corruption in it. However, he's paved the way for all to come to him to be a part of his family, thereby escaping the coming damnation. That's what it means when Jesus told Nicodemus, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God doesn't expect the unbeliever to live holy because no matter how he or she tries, they can't live holy, even when they do good. The good acts of a sinner may be commendable, but they can't be called holy before God because it's corrupted by the sinful nature they carry. So God's expectation of the sinner is not holiness, but repentance and acceptance of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. When the sinner becomes a saint, God's expectation then changes because now you have within you the ability to become like him, holy. Therefore, God can say, be holy because I am holy. 2 Corinthians 7.1 puts it this way, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. It is true that no one's perfect. However, each one of us can walk towards perfection. And this is the standard of God. When you become a child of God, you are not brought into God's family to do your thing your own way. No, you are brought into God's family and enabled to live by God's standard. God does not exist for us, but we for Him. It's very important that you understand this if you really want to have a successful Christian life. That's right, there is such a thing as an unsuccessful Christian life, a life that even though it began the journey, did not finish it well. Not everyone who begins this journey of faith eventually crosses the finish line in the end. Some will fall by the wayside, others will turn around, and some will turn to other distractions. I pray that you and I will finish well. Does God love us? You know He does, and every action of His is proof of that. It's His love that made Him provide His only Son to save a race on its way to destruction. It is love that makes Him take us serious when we don't take Him serious. His love makes Him discipline us when we need to be corrected as we make our journey. The love of God, His mercy and judgment all work together. He is not divided. For instance, you're listening to this message today because God loves you and wants to teach you something you might be missing in your life. You see, we live in a world of lies and deception, and so many children of God are blown here and there, led in the opposite direction of where God's pointing for us to go. They think that they know what they're doing, but in reality, they're destroying their Christian work. The passage we saw earlier makes it clear that we have the responsibility to purify ourselves. You can't just let your life go with the wind or the flow of this world. You'll just end up where you don't want to be. Being a Christian, like I mentioned from the beginning of this message, is characterized by a substitution of one life for another. It involves a surrender of yourself over to God's sovereignty, choosing to live by His standards rather than yours or the world's. Again, I repeat, being a Christian means to surrender to God's standard. When you choose a lifestyle or any action that goes contrary to everything God stands for, not only are you committing a sin, you're also destroying your Christian life bit by bit. What are some of these destructive habits that can ruin your Christian journey? One, attempting to mix the old life with the new. You cannot produce God's fruit or his results by sowing the seeds of the flesh or the world. Galatians 6, 7 to 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. In one of our previous videos, I shared with you that it was your spirit that got saved at the new birth and that your mind wasn't. That's why you discovered that your mind still thinks and wants to make you do things like you used to. It's a programming, and therefore must be renewed and upgraded to God's system now. In the same manner, in receiving Jesus, you must understand that light and darkness cannot mix. 
The world lies in darkness and operates under the power and influence of the devil, the Lord of Darkness. Yes, you were once there. Yes, you used to be like that. Yes, you are still in the world now. Still, you must understand that you're a new creation now. You've been washed now. Now you're okay by a different set of rules. Now you operate differently. Now you have a higher calling. Before you lived for yourself. Now, however, you live for God. When you think or act contrary to his mindset, like the illustration of the old and new wine, you'll only destroy yourself. Luke 5, 37-38 and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. To come to Jesus and claim to receive him only to go back and try to live a life still hanging on to the way you used to makes your faith and salvation very questionable. Paul wrote, let the thief who is in Christ steal no more. This means that you have a responsibility to learn the culture of the kingdom of God, which of course rests greatly on love and holiness, and live by it. You make a mockery of the death and sacrifice of Jesus and the grace of God to think you can live a mixed life. It won't work. Satan will only take advantage of you and enslave you even more, trapping you until he succeeds in destroying your soul Part of the change that may occur when you receive Jesus will require you to leave many things, and in some cases, many people behind, in order to be who God calls you to be. This is because the things you used to do will get in the way of your walk with God. Ungodliness brings reproach to God's name, exalts the power of Satan over you, and traps you in guilt in the very bondage Jesus died to free you from. Some of these mixtures also include secret sins, those sinful indulgences we participate in when no one's there. Coming from one who's had his own fair share of struggling with secret sins, I'll tell you this, it kills your spiritual life gradually. Unless you're not being honest with yourself, you will never feel confident before God or anyone at that. You'll not grow in faith to take authority over the devil because you know in secret you're still his slave. You will struggle in prayer and studying the word Soon, you'll find yourself back where you came from, in your Christian journey, aborted. But we've not been called to this experience, dear child of God. Instead, we've been called to God's mercy, grace, love, and promises. I encourage you to choose today to yield to God by asking the Holy Spirit to help you separate yourself from the old way of life and embrace the new on Jesus so that you can bring glory to God. Two, passiveness toward the things of God. Another habit you must be wary of, which is a danger to your Christian life, is the lifestyle of being passive or indifferent towards the things of God. Permit me to tell you that it's a sign of spiritual deficiency to be indifferent toward things God's passionate about. Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. A sign of spiritual healthiness is spiritual fervency. A lack of it is a sign that something's wrong. And like an illness, if not properly handled, will cause great damage. Evidence of passiveness is when you aren't passionate about spiritual matters, like praying consistently, skipping prayer times or fellowship with other believers, neglecting your personal devotion with God, evangelizing or sharing your faith and being more interested to talk about things other than God. Consistently practicing these things will leave you powerless and soon faithless. You may still profess Christianity, but your life will be void of its power. You must ask God to continue to stir his fire in your heart and make you more conscious and desirous of him than anything else. If our eternal destination is heaven, then it should make greater sense to have heavenly passions. It should make more sense to desire more and more ways to engage with heavenly things than earthly. Don't you agree? Three, the habit of making and associating with ungodly companions. You see, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron, 
Wood is useful in its own way but cannot be considered a tool for sharpening any sharp-edged tool. God does not say you should not be friendly. You know, we can't minister to or save the world by not interacting with it. Jesus was and still is the sinner's friend. He's accessible and willing to deliver them without casting off those who come to him. However, he is the sinner's friend. Jesus only calls the obedient saint his friend. John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. The Bible tells us that a person who walks with wise people will himself be wiser, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Constantly befriending and associating yourself with the world is unhealthy to your walk with God because of the effect it can have on you. You must choose instead to surround yourself with like-minded people, fellow believers heading the same way you are, and having enough spiritual value to help you be a better Christian. There are many other habits that can threaten your walk with God. However, God has given us a key to overcoming these habits, and it's to lay aside every weight in your life and fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1-2 Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endures the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, let Jesus be your focus, your purpose, your intention, and your goal. When He's all that matters, everything else will fall behind the shadow. Satan's deception will be exposed, and you will break free. Ask the Lord to help you lay these habits aside and fix your eyes on Jesus until the end. The hardest truth for most people to swallow and yet remains the truth nonetheless is that no matter how much of a wonderful personality you have, how much community service you render, it doesn't matter that people seem to love you everywhere you go. Go. You step way outside of your comfort zone to be of benefit to people, to care for them, pay their bills, be nice to them provide for them, and so on. You will still be despised and despised. Why? It's really that simple. The enemy despises you regardless of your outlook on life, whether positive or negative. He hates you and will recruit other people to do the same and work against you. The devil doesn't go after only those who identify as good or bad people. He hates all men. All, without exception, will aim to cheat, hurt, and destroy all, ultimately. With this in mind, it is a very sick joke to think that you can go through life without issues. As long as you are a good guy and avoid all conflict, you can escape through life unscathed. You will have to sit up and take life more seriously than that cruising through without issues for as long as you keep to yourself, thinking that you will be exempt from hate and trouble if you remain in seclusion. Jesus had this to say about the world in relation to us as children of God. Matthew 10, 21 through 22 and 24 through 25. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death and the father the child and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth till the end shall be saved. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household?
Jesus made it clear that a very distinct line had been drawn between those of the world and those of the Lord. You cannot be of God and be completely accepted in the world. This system, people, and policies will frequently undermine your decision to go all out for God. You are fully aware that your life is wasted if it is not thoroughly wrapped up in God and His Word. This resolution that has been made is then put to the test of time and trials over many seasons of life. You are heavily tested at all levels. You are pressed on all fronts. And you are fought against, insulted, robbed, some hurt, and even some killed or maimed. This is all proof of heavy resistance against the truth of God in the life of a man or woman sold out to God. Jesus was aware of this, and hence he prepared himself readily at all times, never taking to heart the love of man, nor the high praises they sang of him. He was fully aware of the fickle nature of man's thoughts and actions. He stood unmoved by the insults, the doubts, or commendations of anyone but God. This was demonstrated by the fact that he could be found daily waiting on God in the hidden crevices of mountains and hills, far from the rights of men. Make time for God to tell him the true worth of his daily work for God. Jesus was given desperately to prayer, for he knew that he deeply needed the counsel of God on all things if he must fulfill God's plan for his life with distinction. You see, the enemy's agenda is to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your peace as you stand in God's plan for you and infect that plan till he kills it. He desires to continue this till he has destroyed the life of that dear son of God. John 10, 10 through 11. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus is the opposite of this. He has come to give you life and to satisfy that life with good things. Jesus, aware of the plan of the enemy, desperately clung to God in prayer. If he had to be safe from the attempts of his enemies to trap him, using his words and tricks, he had to wait on God to give him the wisdom to avoid these traps. In one such encounter, the wisdom God gave to Jesus to answer these evil men was so profound that it ended such attacks against him. Matthew 22, 35 through 46. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Another reason Jesus prayed earnestly was that he knew that he could not do anything without God in the mission God had sent him on. The tenacity of Jesus' prayer life then was powered by hunger, a deep hunger for God. He desires God above all else, fully aware that God is the driving force behind the fulfillment 
of the divine mandate on his life. Success and greatness are unavoidable when God is present behind a man. The enemy may have all manner of plans and agendas against your life, and he does. God is the answer to the attack of the enemy. God's special agenda is to keep you far above all the attacks and schemes of the enemy. Ephesians 1, 20-22 Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. In the name of Jesus, you are above reproach, above the enemy's harassment, and above the destructive influence of the devil and his minions. You are a child of God, and you are therefore exempt from all the destructive attacks of the devil as a full-blooded son of God, your life is hidden in the very center of God's will as a full-blooded son of God. As a result of this, you are not victim of the plans of the enemy to derail several in his generation and beyond. Your life will not be cut short and your destiny will not be summed up unless you reach your full potential. You are the apple of God's eye and therefore cannot be touched. The one who will touch you must first ascend to heaven, gain access to God, and remove his eyes. Because as certain as it is impossible, you are far above all the antiques of hell attempting to destroy your life. You are the light of the world, created to be the salt of the earth according to God's word. Hence, you cannot be snuffed out before your time. Your results and attainment will keep astounding your world. Your elevation and ascension above your contemporaries are secured in Jesus, and the enemy cannot exact his will and plans. At any level, no weapon formed against you will prosper. You are set apart for the blessings, the power release, and the anointing of the Lord to be ahead and not beneath. Your days of outstanding success and uplift are unnumbered. You do not know what lack means. Failure is an alien term to your life. You are an established force to be reckoned with in your field of endeavor. Jesus is coming through for you to heal you, lift you, keep you from harm to guide and protect your family, assist your rise in your career, oversee the raising of your children, to establish a kingdom in your marriage. His peace, his love, his power, his joy, and his excitement will never leave or exit your dwelling place. You are blessed above reproach. Your paths drop fatness and your ways are anointed with the blessings of God. You are a burning and shining light for all to see. You cannot be burnt out, and you cannot be hidden away from view. You are lifted out of obscurity. Your name is associated henceforth with the high places of life and of existence. You no longer remain on the floor. You are the unique blessing of the Lord to that establishment where you work. Your worth will become clear as you continue to work there. Family and marriage will not fail. Your Lord's wisdom has been released on you to aid you in your pursuit of happiness and stability in your relationship and marriage. Your home will not be destroyed by the enemy. Your children will be taught by the Lord. Your little ones are influenced positively. Your offspring are exempt from losing their way and missing the path. You will no longer fall into the snare of depression and the death of countenance. Jesus shows up for you in the darkest seasons of your life. The way God comes through for you will stun your world and the company that surrounds you. 
you will not end up on the deathbed of illness and pain. Jesus heals you this very moment from all the attacks of the enemy. You are free from all the yoke of the enemy now in Jesus' name. All the devil's petty schemes. I want to share a very important message with you today, my friend. This message is about a special kind of relationship in your life. Relationships could be an amazing gift or a destructive weapon in your life. It is true what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Look at the wonderful benefits of having a healthy individual in your life. I honestly believe that things are easier when we have the right person or persons in our lives. If you have that one person in your life who sees you for who you truly are and still love, appreciate and support you still, you are truly blessed. And indeed, God wants you to have such people in your life. There are different kinds of relationships that define us. The old saying, show me your friend and I will tell you who you are, still holds true today. The thing is this, the kind of person or persons you have in your life will have an influence, directly or indirectly, on how far you go in destiny with God. They will either drive you in deeper or draw you away from God. How do I know this? I saw from the Bible that God was much concerned about the relationship His covenant people, the Israelites, might have with different nations around them. And so He gave them warnings about that association. Of course, they would disobey those warnings and face the consequences. Yet, that did not stop God from speaking to them about it. God went as far as even warning the Israelites not to intermarry with those nations because they were idol worshipers and would most likely encourage the people to turn to their idols as well. This brings me to the center of my message today. There is a special person God wants you to have in your life. This person will end up becoming your spouse and helping you build a godly home where godly children who would represent the kingdom of heaven on earth will be raised. God, being so concerned about you, is about to use this video to teach you the signs that someone may or may not be the right one for you in marriage and what you must do about it. It is not just about loving someone alone or wanting to be with him or her. There are other factors that you must see as well. If you build marital relationships on feelings or excitement alone, don't expect it to last or be God's conduit into the world. Solomon's story is a perfect example of what can happen to a person if you marry the wrong person. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built the high place for Chemish, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. Because to Solomon's wisdom and wealth, he became very popular among the nations and everyone wanted to be in his favor. 
Most kings and leaders gave their daughters to him as gifts to seal their national diplomatic treaties, combined with the ones he married by himself because of his lust for much women. Solomon soon had a large harem of 700 wives and 300 mistresses. Solomon's untamed desire for much women plunged him into spiritual decadence. These women were idol worshipers, and they all came into their marriages with their idols. Soon they were requesting for their husband's support in worship, and Solomon gave in. He had built God's temple. Now he was building temples for idols all over the land for his wives. And soon his own heart turned too. Let me quickly state this first. I know we live in a world where marriage is not a big deal, and almost everyone, including some Christians, scorn at its sanctity. Our society has taken away the original divine definition of the marital covenant and replaced it with its own convenient definition, and many of us have bought into it because it suits us. To many individuals today, the marriage is just a legally binding relationship between two people with a strong emotional connection or some form of contract in place meant to satisfy a particular goal, a goal which, once met, nullifies the marriage like it was nothing. The marriage has been reduced to something anyone can do when they feel like it, and when they no longer feel like it, they could go their separate ways. However, dear saint, marriage is much more than that. It is God's business, His very own institution, where He continues to raise and increase His army on earth. We were told in school that the family is the smallest unit of society. It is a fundamental part of the society and nation building. Whatever decadence reigns in the families in a nation will reign in that nation at large. Why? Because the nation is made up of the family. I pray that you will listen to God's ultimate instructions regarding your choice of a partner and obey whatever He asks you to do. It is a good thing to find someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. God created us for interaction. He also made us with emotions so that we can connect with each other in intimate ways. However, when it comes to the subject of something as serious as the right person for you, then you must learn to know when God is trying to tell you that this is not the one or this is the one. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Remember what I said about making your journey easier and sweeter because of the right person in your life. Your first greatest companion is your spouse. And so you must be extra careful when it is time to make the decision. Here are four signs that someone is not the one for you to get married to. Number one, they are not born again. The child of God has no business getting involved with the child of the devil, no matter the attraction. You must never forget that you are light, a child of the light, and they are darkness under Satan's dominion until they become saved. You may be friends with them to give God an opportunity to save them, but to become intimate with them and walk towards a marital relationship is a risk you should not take. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Many Christians have been greatly wounded, while some have not survived the error in this kind of decision. This should be one of the first things to look out for in someone you intend to allow into your personal space. Are they saved? Do they believe in Jesus Christ? Have they surrendered their hearts to Jesus as children of God? What belief systems do you share in common? What is the likelihood that tomorrow they won't turn back on you tomorrow because they were truly never saved? By being saved, I don't mean they are able to quote the whole Bible from cover to cover. This may be great, but it isn't the main yardstick. Are they saved enough that they exalt Christ in their lives above themselves, their desires, and above anyone else? If you can answer this question in the affirmative, then they have passed. But if not, they must reconsider their relationship. Don't forget Solomon and his wives. Number two, 
They are not interested in the things of God and do not encourage you to become who God wants you to be. This is another big sign to watch out for as a child of God who honestly loves and wants to follow God all the way. And by this, I mean a serious Christian. You must check their interest in the things that interest you, which is the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 2 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Does this person have their eyes on heaven? How do they respond when you talk about the Bible, going to church, sharing your faith, obeying specific commandments that go contrary to popular culture, and so on? Do they prefer doing other things and consider God as just a diversion to answer as a religious preference? Beloved, in this day and time, you don't just need someone with the profession of Christ, but one with the possession, not just one with the words, but one with the fruits. You need someone who will be strong for you in the day of adversity when your own strength cannot carry you. You need someone who would at least support the visions God lays in your heart. There is no point being with someone and then traveling life's path alone. You cannot afford to miss this, my friend. Ask the Lord to help you notice this in time so that you do not waste your time, your strength, nor your resources on the wrong person. Number three, they try to seduce you to sin with them. Another serious sign is the sign of seduction to sin. I know that we all can be tempted to sin, especially with someone who we truly care about. However, the fear of God must be the center of our romantic relationships to help us honor Him with our bodies. The Bible has told us that our bodies are God's temples and we must honor Him with them no matter what. Therefore, a sign that someone is not right for you is that he or she consistently tries to make you break this commitment to God. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 14 Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Whoever tells you that unless you fornicate with them, they will leave you is not the right person for you. Let them go. You must not displease God to retain anyone in your life. If you do that, you kick God out of that relationship, putting yourself at risk. It pays to wait, being willing to pay that price. You will not regret keeping your body for the right person. Whoever does not respect that does not deserve to be in your life. Number four, they are abusive towards you, risking your mental, financial, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. There's no excuse for abuse. This is a sign of a lack of the fear of God and of danger ahead, and you must take it seriously. Don't play around it. The right person will cherish and protect you. The wrong person will use and abuse you. The right person will appreciate you, trying their best to assure you of security. The wrong person will only bully you, make you feel less of who you are, and hurt you again and again. Once you notice these things, fear, anxiety, insecurity, timidity, or any form of danger or bullying, please, for your own good, consider it a sign that this is not the one for you. Do not try to endure it and get married to them. It is too high a price to pay. How do you get these signs? Draw nearer to God. The closer you are to God and the more you practice listening and obeying His instructions, the easier it will be for Him to speak to you and for you to hear and obey. Your safety, fulfillment, and peace is in your obedience to God's instruction. I pray you will be numbered among those who got this thing right. In Jesus' name, amen.